Last but not least, we're going to look at the yaw control and stability. And I finally got this thing to the point where I like how it flies. So I think we'll start off by showing you what I've changed in the yaw axis here. Um, yaw moments. And then we'll do a bit of a test flight and I'll demonstrate what some of these things do. <coughs> Excuse me. So yaw moment due to side slip. That's uh, reduced to 140. I took out the adverse yaw from the ailerons. Um, I have no way of knowing how much it actually is. You can put some value in there if you want, I suppose. You could put the original value back in. Um, but given that the ailerons deflect equally up and down, probably means that the adverse yaw was not significant because usually they design an airplane with what they call differential aileron throw where it goes up more than it goes down. Uh, rudder control, uh, yes, reduced a little bit there. Now this is our dampening, basically. Uh, yaw rate here. I drastically reduced that. And this is an area where <clears throat> the vast majority of flight models out there um, suffer. And I'll explain that in a little bit. Uh, same with the side force. Now you can see I zeroed out the side force from rudder. And I'll explain why I did that. And I kept the other two values the same just because <clears throat> so these two values here this uh, side slip is basically your 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 side slip angle it's, it's when you deflect the rudder what angle of side slip do you get and these two work together actually because this the, the rudder control will affect also how what angle you get but it will also defect, affect how quickly the airplane moves in the yaw uh, axis. So you have to tweak these two values together. If you reduce one, you pretty much have to reduce the other one to keep, uh, to keep things in check. So what I was aiming for is on this graph here. I determined that uh, 28 degrees of rudder would give me 22 degrees of side slip angle. So that's my 0 0.38 radians there. Everything's in metric on my spreadsheet. I apologize. I have to convert everything. But it just it's just easier for me to work with in metric. But what we're looking for here is, okay, let's say you're flying along. You got the rudder deflected full. You know, you're flying in a huge side slip. And then all of a sudden you neutralize the rudder. What happens? Well, the tail starts to swing back. And it goes through zero, and it overshoots to the other side, and it comes back again, and it overshoots zero again. So after one cycle, from crest to crest, it takes 7.5 seconds, and our yaw angle is about 14 degrees. So that's what I'm looking for in the simulator. And that's what I tweaked uh, these two values here to give me. So that's what, that's what it gives me. It gives me my 22 degree yaw angle and my seven and a half degree or seven and a half second uh, period on the oscillation there. And then my dampening, my yaw rate here, this is the dampening of actually this value was 150 minus 150 um, to give me this response here. And I compromised on it a bit, and I'll explain why. I went, I settled on 500. A value of 1,000, approximately 1,000, gave me a critically dampened oscillation. And what that means is it comes down here, but it doesn't overshoot zero. So it's, it's dampened. So it comes down, and then it kind of comes out like this to zero and stays at zero. So it doesn't actually overshoot. 
and the original value here of 6,000 was just way over dampened. Um, what happens in that case is it, it kind of comes down like this. It doesn't dampen, it doesn't come down quickly enough. It doesn't get to zero quickly. <laughs> you know, like it, you want to drive it to zero quickly and then dampen it quickly. And that wasn't happening. It was, it was kind of just taking forever to come back to zero. And so it was over dampened. And if the, if the real airplane was like that, I mean, the designers could have chopped half the tail off because obviously they don't need it. Um, so I settled on a compromise value here of 500, and that's because the yaw damper doesn't work in FSX, basically. It doesn't work like, properly because a yaw damper should give you a critically dampened oscillation. But what it does in FSX is it, it actually makes it worse. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh I'll explain later. It's um but let's just say it doesn't work properly. So it doesn't really work to dampen the oscillations whatsoever. So I settled on 500 and what that gives us is a slight overshoot of only a few degrees and then it comes back and then it dampens out very quickly. So The key, the key idea here is if you're looking at any flight models, is if the airplane was built with a, with a yaw damper installed, chances are it needed it. Um, you know, so if your airplane's, you know, wagging its tail like this back and forth all the time, it probably needed a yaw damper. And every airplane will do this to some extent. Lighter airplanes, obviously, it's not as noticeable. Heavier, faster airplanes, it's very noticeable. And that's why they have yaw dampers built into them. Okay, so um, the next thing. So there's all kinds of effects we're looking at here. Not just besides this, there's coupling. There's roll coupling on the yaw axis. And what I mean by that is whenever you yaw the airplane, it wants to roll <laughs> one way or another. And there's all kinds of factors working together here to cause that effect. So looking at our airplane here, you know, your fin is base and rudder is basically half of a wing because it's well above the center of gravity. So when you deflect that rudder to the left, let's say, you know, the nose wants to swing to the left, but now you've got lift, you're lifting in this direction. So it actually wants to roll the airplane to the right. And then there's dihedral. There's the dihedral on the tail here and a little bit on the wing. <clears throat> and when you yaw the nose to the left, say, it wants to roll to the left. So the dihedral kind of counteracts the effect of the rudder, you know, at the fin acting like half of a wing. And then there's the other, another effect called, uh, which one is it here? It's yaw rate. Um, yaw moments due to yaw rate. No, that's our dampening. Uh, where is it? Let me look over here. Um, do, 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 do. Actually, it might be roll. It's in the roll section. Roll due to yaw rate. Uh, there it is there. And so that is caused by, you know, the sweep of the wing and the effect of one wing traveling faster than another, like in a turn, for example. And it's not a large effect. It's a very small effect, but it is there and you need to account for it. So those are the main things we're looking at. Side slip effect. Uh, our dihedral effect, I mean, roll due to side slip. That's your dihedral effect. These are your coupling, coupling uh, effects here. There's your roll due to rudder, uh, acting like half a wing, like I said. And your yaw rate, one wing traveling faster than another in a turn or something like that. 
and so I actually worked some of those parameters out on my spreadsheet here for example based on my maximum yaw angle here I was able to plot this curve knowing how much lift we're getting from our vertical surface now roll rate with rudder this is what I was talking about so we know the vertical moment the height above the center of gravity and we can figure out a roll rate there and it was about two and a half degrees per second which is not a lot and then my dihedral angle here I, I averaged it out to three degrees and same thing that worked out to 15 degrees per second so when you subtract these two are equal or opposite to each other so when you subtract this effect from this effect you get about 13 13 degrees a second so that's what I was aiming for and then this effect here um, due to yaw rate that's the effect of one wing traveling faster in a turn and so you got about almost not even one degree per second there like half a degree so but what this does is this cancels out um, any tendency to you know airplanes are built with dihedral so that it cancels the effect of one wing traveling faster than another and, and wanting to roll into the turn. So they put a little bit of dihedral in there to cancel that. Not too much. Or else then the, the airplane has uh, too much stability there and then it wants to roll back level. So what you're really aiming for is, is for the bank angle to remain constant in a turn. Um, because it's, it's easier to fly if the airplane stays where, the, where you put it. You know, if the pilot makes a control input and he's not fighting anything, like any stability or anything like that, or Dutch rolling tendencies or anything like that, the airplane's easier to fly. Now, for training airplanes, you, you may want a little bit of stability there, but a positive stability, I mean, spiral stability. But mostly you want pitch stability. That's what you mostly want. And then you want neutral roll stability. Um, that's what makes the airplane the easy, easiest to fly and, and the, you know, for training purposes. So we're going to go for a little flight here. Actually, you know what? I'm going to add, let's reverse. Let's put our fuel flow scaler back to where it belongs. And let's put all our cargo back in. And I think that's all I have to do. Um, no, nope, we'll put our empty CG back where it belongs. And I think that's it. So before we fly, there's one more thing we have to do. This airplane had a rudder limiter, which automatically restricts rudder control movement when the aircraft exceeds 190 knots, disengaging when speed reduces to 160. So this is similar to what we did with the ailerons and the elevator in the previous episode, only now we have to do it on the rudder. So we go to our table 519 in the air file. And 160 knots is 85 on the dynamic pressure. And then 190 knots is 120. And we got 18% on the y-axis because the rudder is limited to, what did, they, what did they say here, 5 degrees? 5 degrees on either side of the trimmed position. So if the total full travel is 28 degrees, and we're limited to five. That's, I think, uh, about 18%. So uh, all other points above that, we're also at 18% on the y-axis. So that's our rudder limiter modeled. So 
I think we're done. I think that's it. That's it. Well, I'm, that's all I'm doing anyway. I mean, you can go, you can go into every little detail if you really want to. Um, but that's enough for me. I'm happy with how it flies. We just have one final test here. And that is to test the stability on autopilot. Because uh, I know a lot of guys like to fly at 16 times simulator rate. So you kind of want to make sure the airplane's going to be stable on autopilot. So we're going to do that. Let me close this off. Don't need that anymore. Whoops. So yeah, my dad actually flew on one of these things. So he tells me. He was working on a ship, and I guess the, the crew got off in Japan, and they missed their flight uh, back to England, so they had to fly out to Singapore to catch another flight, and it happened to be a BOAC Comet 4. So I found a timetable here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fly the whole route just, just for the hell of it. Um, so we're going to start on the Tuesday here. Um, so yeah, that was in uh, February of 1965. So just a few months later, I think in October or November, BOAC finally retired their comets. And uh, so I'm going to start here in Auckland at 8.30 in the morning. And then we're going to go to Sydney. Half an hour, an hour turnaround there. To Darwin. 50 minutes. To Singapore. And then to Rangoon. Calcutta. Karachi. Damascus. Dusseldorf. And then finally landing in London. So that should keep you busy for a while. So here we are at Auckland, 8.30 in the morning. I got all our cargo and passengers turned on, our CG's right. We've programmed our rudder limiter, our rudder behavior, or yaw behavior I should say, is pretty acceptable now I think, based on what aerodynamics and physics predicts will happen. So it's a nice day for flying. There's not much weather, unfortunately. I was kind of hoping to see how it responds to turbulence. But if any of you guys have uh, who've been following along and you've made the similar uh, changes that I've made, you'll undoubtedly be able to fly it for yourself and uh, see for yourself how it responds to turbulence. I think I'm going to need some up elevator trim here. I forgot to dial that in. Let's uh, bring it back close to the red range, right about there. Whoops, stay on the runway. <laughs> oh. We don't have, we're down one engine. What's going on here? This is a three engine takeoff. <laughs> All right, well, we're going. Let's see what happens. This is exciting. Here we go. Oh, there we go. The engine kicked in finally. Guess I didn't wait long enough for them all to start. Gears going up. she goes
gear up before 185. Start bringing the flaps up. Now, let's see here. I got my GPS. 1,100 miles to Sydney. So I hope you guys like how the airplane handles now. Performance will be unaffected. I didn't change anything with the main drag parameters. Um, so climb performance, uh, level speed performance, all that will be unaffected. I didn't mess with the flaps either. I didn't check the flap lift or drag or anything like that. I could have, and I may do in the future, but like I said, I just wanted to address the main handling characteristics of the airplane. Let's get some uh, autopilot going on here. Oh, there's okay. We've got a little bit of a bounce in the pitch axis here above four times. No, nope. above eight. Oh, there it is. Okay. We got a little bit of an oscillation there, above 20,000 20, feet or so. Not objectionable. Not to me, anyway. It's dampening out. How do you like that? 28,000 feet. It's almost gone. Let's go 16 times on the simulator rate. Eh, not bad, not bad. There we are. We're at 31,000 feet. Now, there was a roll. I did have on a previous flight that I did. Uh, there was a roll oscillation, and so I had to change, I changed the autopilot here, the nav proportional, changed that to a 6, and the nav integrator to a 0.15, so that it still it doesn't overshoot the, uh, you know, it doesn't overshoot your uh, localizer when you're picking up the ILS. That seemed to work pretty good in my, in my tests anyways, you can try it. Um, I tried messing up, messing around with the uh, glide slope uh, values here to control that pitch oscillation, but nothing seemed to have any effect. And like I said, the yaw damper really doesn't work properly. It's only a proportional control. It doesn't have any real dampening. Um... It's like the rudder position was just proportional to the, your side slip angle. It had, and it didn't really matter whether the nose was swinging to the right or the left, only which side of center it was. So if the nose swings to the right through zero, the odd damper would apply right rudder, <laughs> which is fine if, if, you know, if the nose is off to the right but it, and it's swinging back to the left, then yeah, you want to put some right rudder in to stop it you know, when it gets close to zero. But that's not really what was happening. So it was actually, as soon as the nose swings through zero, it applies opposite rudder. So it actually helps it in the opposite direction and doesn't really dampen it. So that's what I meant when I said the odd damper doesn't work. <clears throat> um, yeah. So yeah, with this pitch velocity here, 
I was able to uh, control this this uh, bouncing here in the in the pitch axis. Okay, here we got a little bit of wind. You can see the airplane responding to it. The world's first jet airliner to enter service. And the Comet 4 was the first to offer a transatlantic jet service, if I'm not mistaken. Shortly follow, followed very shortly by the uh, Boeing 707. So this should be interesting. We have a 90 degree crosswind almost. We're going to come in on runway 16 left. But the wind is out of uh, 236 at, what was it, 13? Something like that. So now we're going to see how this thing really handles. So there's a guy making a Comet model for X-Plane. I can't remember his name right now, but supposedly it's almost finished. And I don't know if it's going to be a payware airplane or not. But I'd be interested to see how it flies compared to uh, what I've done here. Just to see the similarities or differences. So I may have to purchase X-Plane 10 to do that. So I think we'll do a little fly past to Sydney here. Before we turn around and land on 1-6 left. A couple of stadiums there. Opera House coming up on the left here. Frame rates are hurting a little bit. Okay, we're looking for 185 for the landing gear. Gear is going down. Oops. Okay, what's up? Okay, flaps are going down 40. And supposedly there wasn't much extra lift beyond 40 degrees. Just drag. Flaps could go down 60 and 80 degrees. And 
more trim, more trim up here. I hope this is one six left. Looks like it. All right, let's go sixty flaps. We got a strong crosswind from the right. About 90 degrees. So this is going to be interesting. Full flaps. Okay, kick a tiny bit of left rudder. Ooh. We have arrived. And it's weather veining to the right, as you would expect. So I'm not sure what my next subject would be. It all depends on what kind of documentation I can find. Um, like I said, I could do the same thing to the go through the same process with the Viscount or the DC-8s. Um, the Airplane Heaven Mosquito is imminent, I think. So that may be the next one. We'll wait and see what happens with that one. Whoa, we're going a little fast here. So I'm looking forward to that mosquito. I'm getting ready for that. And I do have lots of documentation on the mosquito. So we'll have what might be my next subject. We'll see. And uh, so that's it for, uh, for the first airplane in the series. Thanks for checking it out. Anybody who did, I hope you get something from it. You know, if not, if I put you to sleep, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's the way it is.